Hello, everybody. This is Christopher Phillips, fairly fearless founder of the nonprofit Democracy Cafe. And this is our program, Cafe Aratista. Uh, Aratista is my coinage. I um, have dual US Greek citizenship. I learned it from my yaya, my Greek grandmother, and it means to be an excellent all rounder in which uh, duty to self and duty to others go hand in glove. And the word we have for that in Greece is arete. So to me, an aratista is somebody who's a living embodiment of that. And my guest today, Nawi Ludikins, who is a socialist activist, uh, Mexican-Australian, uh, who I had the great pleasure and honor to meet for the first time when we were living in San Miguel de Allende uh, in, in the state of Guanajuato in Mexico, uh, at, where her mom still lives. And, uh, and, and now, Nawi, you are, for quite some time now, you've been in Australia, I uh, believe a student at La Trobe University, but you've been really fighting the fight, uh, fighting the good fight now with great passion and commitment to causes that so many young people in the United States, at least, are, are just now beginning to even remotely be enlightened about. But you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I moved to Melbourne in 2015 and I was studying at RMIT at the time and met um, Socialist Alternative, which is a uh, revolutionary socialist um, organization here. Doing activism um, with them ever since. Um, and yeah, this year I moved to La Trobe University to study arts, um, majoring in Aboriginal studies, which is um, again, a big, big um, issue in Australia that has also, uh, I guess, developed mm. and expanded mm. over the past couple of months, um, being inspired by Black Lives Matter um, in the US. Um, yeah, there's been massive, massive protests for Aboriginal rights. Um, yeah. Mm. So I want to unpack a lot of that. But first, when you, when you went to Australia to study, did you think this is what you would be doing? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, no. Um, what was at the your time, consciousness? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought I was gonna, you know, go back into doing circus and, you know, it was just a bit of a gap year to, I don't know, go to uni, study something and then go back to uh, doing circus. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think when you begin to uh, learn about how society is structured, how it's fundamentally unequal, and you learn, I think, about what you can do in the here and now. I think basically, yeah, if you turn your back on that, when you, I guess, know a bit more, I think that, yeah, I don't know if that's a choice that everyone gets to make, but I'm really happy that mm -hmm. I was with people who mm -hmm. had a political project and uh, were very hands on and wanted to include um, as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. So you said going back to circus, you were in something called Gravity Works. Uh, yeah. And so, and what, what did you, what were you doing? I mean, what had been that, what was that passion? Um, yeah, well, I was an aerialist. So, um, yeah, I did aerial hoop, trapeze. Um, My daughter's going to follow in that footstep right now. Yeah, yeah, they're the best. Um, and yeah, I mean, Nisha and Ceci, um, who were some of the key um, teachers, um, were just really amazing. And it was great to be surrounded by women who uh, were so talented um, and just so, yeah, wonderful with their bodies. And just, yeah, it was, I think, expression in a very different way, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely miss it a lot. But um, yeah, it was a really cool time I was teaching circus um and yeah that's still one of my favorite all-time favorite things to do but yeah but so was serendipitous when you arrived in in australia and you did you how did it happen can you what was it a, a certain meeting a certain event um yeah well i was um at rmit and it was like the open days when uh i don't know they have like the clubs on campus and stuff like that um and you know, like they make you pay big fees in a way. So the people I had met were like, let's go get our free things. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. Um, and met a socialist alternative at a little uh, stall that they were having. And someone just asked me, uh, yeah, we're a socialist group. Do you consider yourself left wing? Which I thought was 
the most ridiculous thing anyone could ask because you know in Mexico you're young you're left wing so I was just like seriously that's like what you're gonna ask me in my left wing um but then yeah they they knew all about the 43 missing uh students that were murdered by the state and I thought that that was yeah really impressive that I guess people knew about that in Australia in Mexico. yeah in Mexico yeah. um which yeah I thought it was impressive that people knew about that in Australia because mm -hmm. I had been uh at those rallies in Mexico City um before coming to Australia so I guess that was the beginning of um yeah just kind of yeah like getting to know uh you know the Marxists on campus and going to uh some of the rallies that they were organizing at the time it was a workers strike that was going to happen on March 4th 2015 my first rally um in Melbourne which was cool um yeah so just kind of started investigating more of you know socialist politics we had a thing called socialist discussion groups on Mondays, which are just kind of like a free crash course for anyone who wants to learn uh, Marxism. So yeah, just kind of started going to those and um, yeah, that really opened up the world to me, I guess. Yeah. And so, I mean, you've been a pretty prominent spokesperson there uh, uh, and, and it's, uh, and, and I'm wondering now in this era of uh, police brutality, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, of in Australia, I believe indigenous people make up about 3% of the population, but 30% of them are the proportion behind bars. Um, yeah. I mean, I read yesterday and I sent it to you about a police officer thinking he was being uh, undetected, uh, sadistically tasering a man, an indigenous man, again and again and again and again, though the man was putting up no resistance. And my heart started beating fast because I'm thinking, how many people, even though now lots of people have video cameras and things, how many people are still getting away with this? And I, and I keep asking myself, well, what, how do you rouse and have that call to conscience of regular people? You know, mm. if you're ever going to reach a critical mass on any of these matters, global warming, uh, Black Lives Matter, anything, how do we get regular people to dive in, to take a risk? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess to start there, I think, um, yeah, Australia, basically no one does racism quite like Australia. <laughs> um, it has lots of facets um, in there. Um, when, yeah, like I guess when Black Lives Matter um, erupted, um, you know, David Dungay was an Aboriginal man in uh, Australia in 2015 who, mm -hmm died um, in a corrections facility um, mm. saying, I can't breathe. So really, um, you know, the movement in the US resonates with people in Australia, especially indigenous people, because uh, yeah, you know, blackness in custody happen all of the time. Mm. And really, um, yeah, like they've been fighting for justice for their families, um, you know, for, you know, over like, almost 30 years since the um, Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody in the 1990s um, and nothing has really happened. So really people see this moment as a bit of a catalyst um, mm. to do more. Um, but I think like in the US um, and I think the moment that we're living in at the moment is unique not only because you know Black Lives Matter poses questions of racial equality but because it's a meeting of you know the COVID-19 crisis which is an economic crisis that is deeply deeply um you know rooted at the moment um everywhere so I think that the coalition of that you know compounded with you know racism in the U.S. uh compounded also with you know Obama's kind of like you know legacy in there too um compounded with uh, yeah, just kind of like low wages, poverty, I think makes it a lot more explosive. And I think that that's why people care because when people are saying Black Lives Matter, it's not just, I think, a movement for racial equality. I think it's also about showing people what inequality looks like in the US. Mm -hmm. And I think allowing people around the world to mm -hmm. connect with that, you know, mm -hmm. stand in solidarity with that, but also, you know, provides the space to also mm -hmm. shed light into uh, you know, our own country's, um, mm -hmm. you know, awful policies and unequal uh, practices, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I think like 
I guess like capitalism is going into a crisis and in that crisis, um, it is also revealing itself as an unequal system and as a system actually that the majority of people, uh, you know, I guess make all of the profits in society, yet they don't get any of that in return. So I think for a lot of people that is beginning uh, to, you know, those tensions and contradictions of the system are beginning mm -hmm. to surface a bit more. Mm -hmm. And I think people are at a point where, you know, it's, it's that bad that in a way people are like, well, what do you have to lose? You know, um, we're all unemployed. We might mm -hmm. as well um, come out, you know? Right. So, yeah. I think um, I, I have so many different thoughts. One is, of course, I earned my PhD in Australia at Edith Cowan University in Perth. And I encountered uh, people who are indigenous. Uh, they were telling me about what they call the sorry business and how they or their relatives or family members, you know, were separated from and, and, and had to live in, in a way that uh, reminded me of what Native Americans in the United States were subjected to. But just this inane sense of superiority by whites and that their culture is better. Uh, when, when if you look at the facts, I'm just the converse is, is, is true, I think, in, in ever so many ways. But just that sense that these are, people are less than me, and in many cases treated as less than human. And I think that that, uh, you know, it, it's just so heartbreaking. And you feel, you can feel a sort of an impotence about that. And I'm, and I'm wondering, even with coronavirus and people afraid to, to show up, sometimes people are showing up. They're, they're putting things at risk in a way uh, that even, even more so I wonder than what have I got to lose? It's more like, gosh, you know, if not now, when? And if not me, who? Uh, because what, what's going to happen to society and for kids next door and kids on the other side of the world if we don't not just show others, but show up ourselves somehow right here and now? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely um, it has been a call to action for many, many people. And a lot of people who it's maybe the first time that they've been involved um, in activism and politics. Um, so yeah, like I definitely think it's a call to action. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like racism in, you know, the US and Australia and really anywhere around the world, it's a tool that has been used, you know, since the inception of capitalism to try and um, divide people and try and I guess, um, really make people identify, I think, with their oppressors rather than the people that they truly have commonality um, with. And I think that at the moment there's, you know, in the US with uh, Black Lives Matter, um, the fact that workers are starting to come out in solidarity um, with the protesters, you know, Amazon workers are going on strike. They were doing that before to demand you know, better conditions at work because of COVID, but now they're also uh, coming out and showing their political uh, strength, which also I think shows uh, really where power lies in society. I mean, same thing with the Juneteenth uh, dock workers strike, um, you know? So there's, I think that, yeah, there's definitely a strengthening um, of the movement, which I think poses so many different questions, right? Um, in a way, I mean, I mean, for me, it's just like, it's incredible that even the demand around abolish the police is out there that, you know, mainstream media has had to respond to that. Um, and that, you know, they're bringing in politicians to um, some of the rallies and giving them a platform and they're trying to wedge them. It's like, well, you, you gotta tell me if you're for or against defunding the police, you know, and that is a wedging question, you know? If you would have told me that that was, the conversation in the mainstream like three months ago would have been mm. like what absolutely not you know we're not there as a society yet to even have a discussion around that um but yeah the movement is going so quickly i think um especially in an election time right so there's so many mm. questions i think with that that are you know, a number being of interesting possible opportunities it seems to me but in, but in this backdrop is the coronavirus um, mm -hmm. A vaccine is and distribution is likely a year away, and um, a lot of people are afraid of showing up physically. 
even though that was belied in, in all the protests all over the United States, in Australia, in Mexico, where people believe that, you know what, I, in spite of all this, I still got to go out and, and be part of this. I, I have to take that risk because it's it's either now or never. I mean, I mean there seems to be what there seem to be so many people of a dazzling array of colors, uh, mm -hmm. a dazzling array actually of political perspectives even, who all are agree and converge on the fact that uh, Black Americans are uh, people of color are are being treated in a far different way than people who have white skin are being treated. I don't have to worry about my two daughters mm -hmm. going out and, and, and ever being manhandled in that particular way, I don't think. Uh, but if I had a, a child with darker skin, I'd have to worry about it every second of every day. And so I think that, uh, and, I, and I keep asking myself, what is, what is the catalyst that we can do to make sure that the momentum continues on the ascent as, you know, as the media moves on to other things, if they can, uh, what, what, is, what can be the catalyst to make sure that more and more people like you who keep stepping out and showing up, I mean, year after year? Yeah, I mean, just like on the stuff about racism, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, race is a social construction. There is nothing, uh, you know, normal or biological that you can say about people who have, you know, darker uh, skin, that that implies anything in the world. But part of it is that, yeah, I mean, race is a social construction, but it's actually a, you know, a political, um, I think, connection, really. Um, it's a political category that is assigned to you that has political meaning under capitalism, right? So I think while race is a social construction, it is also felt deeply. And I think that that's exactly what you see, right? With um, racism playing out, um, because it is the case that, you know, black men in the US are gunned down by police. Um, you know, I think it was figures to the every eight hours, a black man is shot by the police. Um, so yeah, I think that racial inequality is deeply, deeply um, rooted in capitalism. Um, I think in terms of kind of like, what do we do when we live in such an unequal society and how do we get people to participate in movements to demand justice around so many different questions? You know, you have trans rights, you have uh, the environment, you have racism, you have all of these different um, questions. And I guess for me, it's about saying we need to kind of like get down to the root causes of a lot of these things, which for me, it's capitalism. And if you want to mm. be able to challenge the system, you need to also understand it and understand how all forms of oppression are connected. And if we mm. want to challenge one form of oppression, we need to be challenging all forms of oppression. And it's a slowly, slowly thing, right? It's like, well, you want to do that, you need to get involved in, you know, learning about it a little bit, come to rallies, don't get demoralized, um, mm -hmm. keep coming and chatting to people who have been involved in it for a long time and, mm -hmm. you know, see about what lessons they learned in, you know, the 60s yeah. and 70s, the 80s. You know, I mean, one of our beloved, in fact, uh, our honorary board member, Cornell West, is also the honorary chair of the Democratic Socialist Party in the United States. And what he talks about isn't, necessarily capitalism per se, but the kind of rapacious corporate capitalism in which even though we're in the worst depression in a century, the stock market's just going up. It has, it's almost sociopathic. It has nothing whatsoever to do, you know, and the government might throw some crumbs to regular people, but it, it's the form of capitalism that has been allowed to take hold and take root and spread its tentacles that, that leaves the vast majority out. Most people have nothing to do with the stock market, but, but the rich are getting obscenely richer in a time when, when tens of millions are out of work. Yeah, I mean, it's like Jeff Bezos um, has been making more money than ever before during um, a pandemic, which is outrageous. And, you know, his workers have been demanding just like, you know, getting paid more for coming to work during a pandemic, asking for 
you know, hand sanitizer, all of these things. So yeah, it's, it's definitely um, an extremely unequal system. But I think that like, I mean, capitalism has a drive to concentrate more and more capital um, in few and fewer hands. It's, it's one of the dynamics, it's the concentration and it is accelerating um, in a way at the moment. Um, but I think it's like, I don't know, I, I think that it's important to um, continue just because there's kind of like all of these different faces in, I guess, the corporate world um, that have influences over all of these things. Like, well, I guess that that's always been capitalism though, because, you know, I like parliament, government is not really there um, to rule for everyone. I don't think that the state can, you know, simultaneously hold the interests of working class people and the interests of the rich. I think that it always upholds the interests um, of the rich because it is there to essentially facilitate the extraction of profits from workers. I think like for profits to ever be made, someone had to get, you know, screwed over in the line and it was definitely not the boss. So I think that that is, you know, expanded and it's obviously more complex. Mm -hmm. um, you know, capitalism has never been more co complex, but mm -hmm. even when talking about things like the market, you know, it's always discussed as this kind of like mystical, magical creature in a way that no one really knows what it's going to do today. Is the market feeling sad or angry or whatever? Um, when really, when you're talking about the market, you're talking about social relations between people realistically that we set um actually well not we as in the people but you know all of these ceos set these relations so actually you know in a society where the majority of people can run society the market doesn't it's not mystical and magical it's actually people so it's also about demystifying all of these terms that i think get thrown around all the time and uh actually making it accessible to people too you know um but yeah how can we take advantage of what is happening right now to make long-term inroads into creating more humane constructs for, for every man and every woman, wherever they happen to live. How can we connect Australia and, and Mexico and the United States in ways that we ordinary people can finally uh, have our voices heard? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I think We're that's- now five years. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a, a hard one in a way, because um, like, I think, people at the moment um, have an idea that change always happens outside um, people, which is an idea, you know, parliament is where the real decisions happen. My boss makes the real decisions, I just go to work. Um, but right now, I think that that kind of mentality is being challenged um, mm -hmm. in a mass way in the US because mm -hmm. politics does not happen in the White House, politics is happening on the streets, you know? people aren't just reading about history, they're literally making history at the moment. So I think we need to um, argue that these are the people that have uh, power. I think the more that you strengthen the labor movement with the Black Lives Matter movement, I think that there's big, big possibilities to um, have some wins along the lines, you know, like defunding the police excellent you know slogan i think a lot of people are you know for that you know why are we funding the police so much and not social workers and you know giving people public housing like mm -hmm. the amount of money that they get should be distributed in all of these different um areas that are needed um you know that doesn't really get to the heart which i think we should you know abolish the police but that's where people are at the moment so we need to concretize these demands and win some you know but also through that process also show the limitations of these demands um mm -hmm. under capitalism you know um so i think yeah if we can have a combination of that i think it's important and you know the effect that it's also having globally um well people aren't you know, people can see um, the connections of it. You know, people can see that racism does happen in Australia. Um, and it's also about being able to explain that the same 
unequal system that operates in the US operates here. The same people that are getting rich at the expense of everyone else is operating here. The racism is here. Um, inequality is here. Um, so it's about connecting, I guess, and being, I don't know, I think a bit inspired by the movements that happen um, at the moment and saying we need to organize things here. You know, for us, it's been, uh, you know, organizing and like, you know, helping to get as many people to the uh, rallies around, you know, uh, stopping black deaths in custody, um, murders in custody, as, um, you know, some people um, here say. So, yeah, I think it's about continuing that activism. Um, yeah. And how do we also, uh, to me, what the backbone of an open society, the fabric of it is having the capacity for criticism to be open and clear eyed and be able to critique things. When we shun such criticism, when we shun even taking a look at whether the promise of our, whether our words match our deeds, whether the promise of our society matches actual practice. When a society, is this a time when we can finally turn that critical lens, not just on others, but on ourselves and recognize our hypocrisies and contradictions, say this is that moment when we really have to, you know, recognize that if we're not part of the solution, then we're a glaring part of the problem. But just start with ourselves, looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, well, what am I doing? Mm. Yeah, I mean, definitely. It's funny that you say, you know, stuff about critical thinking, because in Australia on Friday, um, Dan Tian, who is the education minister, um, announced that he is increasing fees by 113% to the arts. Um, Gosh, you know, I got to Australia just money. in time, you know? I've been told yeah. about the draconian cuts. Oh, it's, it's outrageous. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's pretty worrisome that at a time when, you know, Scott Morrison, the prime minister said a couple weeks ago, like, oh, slavery didn't exist in this country. And you're like, what? Um, <laughs> like people just started obviously posting, like, look at this picture of, um, you know, slaves. How do you think the sugarcane plantation started in Queensland? Slavery, you know? Um, so it's pretty concerning that at a time when we need know actually having art subjects in every kind of uh, course that you're doing um, that those are the ones that are going to be the most expensive um, and yeah like also kind of the argument that you know the market um, has to rule everything in your life that what you study has to be dictated by the market and what where we want you know to push the economy because they always make it sound like, oh, it's where the economy is going. You know, we have no control over that. And it's like, well, that's where you're pushing it. And you're trying to incentivize people to go into degrees that will benefit your economy. But mm -hmm. like, yeah. Um, yeah, so big fights ahead with that. Yeah, big battles. You know, I was going to go to one of the best graduate business schools in the U.S. I was going to be Mr. Business. <laughs> And I shunned it, chucked it for a $52 a week newspaper reporting job in Maine. Then I started writing for a radical newspaper. Um, they paid me like 50 cents an article. <laughs> I was in love. It's called Maine People's Movement. And um, it was really, I mean, I'm a kid from a sprawling, faceless city in Southeast Virginia. And um, it's funny how serendipity can intervene at some point in your life and you either go with it or you don't. But it was really my call to consciousness. And I've been doing this Democracy Cafe activism now for 25 years. But it, it, it belies my family background, uh, which is pretty conservative uh, in, in ever so many ways. Not, not, not totally, there's always nuance. But um, I, I feel like I'm more steeled and inspired and animated right now uh, in, in my early 60s than I've been even maybe when I was back then in your age. It, it, uh, I feel like there's a moment here that uh, with all the horrific tragedies, unspeakable horrors that are happening to innocents, that there's maybe a moment here that can bring people of many different outlooks together just out of a sense of that this isn't right. And, and uh, you have to stand up and be counted. Do you, do you feel that way at all? Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, 
I, I mean, Australia is also a bit of a funny country, um, you know, being involved in politics just because they're so awful, but like their international, um, you know, like image is kind of like the lucky country, all of this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the moment, there's, I think, you know, when you read about the 60s and, you know, the anti-Vietnam War movement, the free speech movement in Berkeley, um, you know, the, like, I don't know, uh, all of these kind of like amazing uh, movements. Um, you're like, wow, I really hope that I get to live through something mm -hmm. um, like this. And um, it's I think that we are. Way. Yeah, I think that we are. Like, um, yeah, I mean, France, you know, has been having huge protests for like over a year now with the Yellow West movements. Like it is, you know, I think there has been a uh, slow build up, I think, to this to this moment. But I think it's also not surprising. I mean, it's what you know, 12 years since the global financial crisis that has not really been fixed. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of countries are starting to, you know, starting to sort out their, mm -hmm. you know, economies that are really impacting people in the worst kinds of ways. You know, the mining boom in Australia um, is basically almost over. So in Victoria, for example, they've swapped to a mini construction boom. Well, that can't, you know, last forever. Um, people in Australia have been able to access um, this thing called JobKeeper, which the government is paying essentially the wages um, of people. Um, and yeah, like they, that is going to run out in September. So what, what's going to happen after that? So yeah, there's lots of question marks, I guess, with that, you know, what happens in mm -hmm. September after all of this, I think Australia is going to be quite, um, combustible. And I think that we're mm -hmm. going to be seeing lots of people, um, you know, in unemployment and, mm -hmm. you know, really having their livelihoods, uh, totally, um, yeah, broken. So I think a lot of people are going to be ready to fight. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, yeah, it's, it's going to happen around the world because mm -hmm. COVID has really uh, brought about a massive, massive um, economic crisis. But also in a really weird way, massive opportunity. Oh. <laughs> yeah. To finally, and has, so I'm trying to say, how do you, how do you project things out for yourself between now and couple years few years from now i mean do you is this do you, do you is there some sort of way to create a concrete strategy for yourself and your own individual life and for what you want to accomplish as an activist um wow i have absolutely no idea in terms of like proper timeline um like at the moment our socialist organization socialist alternative is involved in a uh, electoral project with other people on the left um, here. So we're involved in a party called Victorian Socialists. So I'm gonna uh, be running as a councillor for the South wow. Ward, Moreland area. Um, yeah, so that's, um, yeah, so that'll be interesting um, how that um, happens. Like, yeah. Yeah, elections happen in October, so we're just, um, yeah, kind of, we had pre-selections last week. Um, so, yeah, now it's going to be campaign mode. But again, because of COVID, it's going to be a very different um, campaign. And, yeah, maybe less door knocking or more door knocking. We're still a bit unsure how, um, yeah, how we can get through to people without obviously being you know, safe and all. So yeah, like that's exciting. Um, yeah, I think it's important to try and use right now all platforms available to people to argue and involved in activism and things like that. Um, but yeah. Now I take great hope and heart in people like you that you're, you're, <laughs> you're fighting the good fight. I mean, some days it's really hard and other days maybe a little bit more sense of possibility and optimism but you're you're showing up and and it really uh it, it it i think about you and other young people who are doing it and i ask myself well how can i not also do my bit because of people like you now we how can how can you give us a website or two where people can learn more 
Yeah, totally. Um, so we have uh, www.redflag.org.au. Um, so that is our uh, newspaper website um, for a socialist alternative. And that's where we publish all of um, our articles, but also has more information about how to get involved um, with socialist politics. Um, and also that is on Facebook, Red Flag um, newspaper. So yeah, those, those are definitely pages to check out. Um, Victorian Socialists is another one to check out. So that's the electoral um, project that we're involved in. Um, so yeah, like, I mean, that started in 2018 um, and we've run in like the state elections and then we ran in the federal elections and now it's um, council times. And yeah, I mean, Quite surprisingly, like for the state elections, the first time we've got the fourth largest vote um, outside of, you know, the major political parties, which was really incredible because it was the first time we were ever doing that. So that was, you know, 4% of the vote, which was really quite amazing. Um, mm -hmm. So we're slowly, um, yeah, giving that a go. Um, yeah, I think it's important to try and use all of the tools that we have at our disposal to show the contradictions of capitalism but also to have someone that can also you know be a bit of a thorn in all politicians you know side to say like oh well you're trying to defund public housing well you know there's sixty thousand people on the wait list like is this really a good idea you know tax the rich more all of these kinds of things um so yeah it's it's really cool um and yeah, hopefully we can get more people behind that. Um, I think we're also trying um, to really connect with a bunch of anti-racist um, activists um, that we've been involved with for, you know, over five years to um, participate. Cause yeah, I mean, Black Lives Matter is not going anywhere and nor should it. Um, so we're also trying to make that a big, big angle um, of the campaign. Cause it's, yeah, you know, so important. Oh, that's wonderful. Navi Ludikins, uh, socialist activist, Mexican, Australian. Thank you so much for doing this again with me and uh, for giving me the gift of your time. And let's down the road revisit okay. this again. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for having me. Anyone in, which is